this is what I tell people is that everyone has the wrong framing of money and value. Everyone thinks that things get more expensive over time. The reality is that the money that we use as a store of value and as a medium of exchange is being debased year after year after. Things actually get cheaper over time, but the dollars that you're using to purchase those things just lose value. So David, that's such a good point. So one thing I've really been thinking about the last few years is, okay, the S&P has done so great the last few years. That has it. Well, it's done really great if you price it in terms of dollars. But if you mm -hmm. price the S&P in terms of gold or in terms of Bitcoin, it's a very different graph. David, thank you so much for joining us. It's such a it's such a pleasure how we got connected through our mutual friend, John. And uh, John is co-hosting today. Yes, David, it is the second official time I am co-hosting a Enter the Lineheart podcast. Uh, the previous um, guest we had was probably the most incredible man I've ever known. So you are definitely in good company, um, but it's great to see you. And thank you so much for uh, for agreeing to be on the show. I'm glad to be here, guys. I, I listened to the other podcast with uh, Richie McPeak. Definitely very heavy. A really incredible individual and, and, a, and an incredible podcast you guys recorded. So I will, I will try to uh, to measure up to that in some in some small way. Richie's Richie's he's laughing his ass off from from uh, from up there in the clouds. He would he would definitely be very happy you're on. So for a little context, the way that I met David Lawrence was actually pretty incredible. It was through the first major bankruptcy of any crypto exchange in the United States. It was an exchange that unfortunately all three of us had funds on, which was Celsius. It became insolvent. They locked all of our funds up. It was all over the news. It made world news. It was global news. And like I said, it was pretty profound because it was the first bankruptcy of an exchange. And you can kind of look at that in context. It's almost the same as a bank going under. Um, what we saw with the Lehman Brothers and, and the financial crisis of, uh, you know, 2007, 2008, uh, only in this case, the <laughs> these exchanges were not backed by any government entity. So all those funds were basically locked. And David and I both had a portion of our funds in um, a group called Custody. Custody was a small percentage of the funds that were uh, in Celsius. I believe we had roughly we 40,000 people had their money in custody. And I believe there was about 160 to $170 million locked in that. So that's, that's not chump change. Overall, there were billions in the um, bankruptcy that were locked, but we accounted for about 4%. Um, and the reason that, uh, you know, 40,000 people were able to get either all or the majority of their funds back that were in custody, uh, you know, a large majority is pretty much, I, I'd like to say, because of David's actions and the actions of a, of a few people that fought via proxy, via White and Case, um, in bankruptcy court of the Southern District of New York, because if it were up to the attorneys who were representing the, the bankrupt estate, they would take as much as they possibly could. So, with that said, David, I have no idea how I came across you starting this, this kind of movement to fight for our custody funds, but can you tell me a little bit more about that, how you had the idea and also what separated, for people that don't know anything about this bankruptcy, because most people probably don't, what the difference between custody and earn was? Sure. So the concept on the Celsius platform was that there are two unique account types. There was custody in which Celsius was just act acting as a third party custodian for your funds. And then there was earn in which if you had your money in the earn account, it was first and foremost defined by a different terms of service, but you were actually earning a yield on those assets. So those assets were being lent out into other banks or institutions and you know, put at adjusted risk, and you would get a compensatory interest rate for those those assets being lent out. So there were two completely different classes on the platform. Uh, we luckily enough were in the custody, which basically just says that Celsius is acting like a Coinbase or like a Binance, in which you just have assets on this platform, 
But per the terms of service, we can't actually lend them out. It's still your assets. The story goes that Celsius filed for bankruptcy. Um, and they came out with uh, their first the first day pleadings, which is essentially a, a document that comes out and it tie, it defines the reasons for for going into bankruptcy, and then it gives some company metrics and and within that uh, PDF document that was put on the uh, Stretto website. Uh, it clearly had defined that custody accounts were sold and separate, uh, that Celsius could not have access to rehypothecate funds in, in the custody accounts. And even within their balance sheet, it had those custody accounts segregated or broken out from the earn account. And so that was very a very hopeful development for me. And immediately what I started doing was researching the bankruptcy code in trying to understand what I could do as a creditor. And unfortunately, early on in a bankruptcy, there's really nothing you can do except for write a letter to the judge. And so I think within one or two days, I wrote a letter to the judge. Now, what I didn't realize was I thought this was a confidential letter. And so within the letter to the judge, I basically pulled on the terms of service uh, between the two different earn accounts. I showed why they were different. Uh, I cross-referenced that with the first day pleadings and said, hey, just I don't think that the custody account should be brought through this bankruptcy. I think that these should be released. And I posted that to the judge or I sent it to him in a manner in which I thought was <laughs> a, a private manner. Uh, what I didn't realize is that all those letters actually get posted onto the public docket. And within that letter, I have my full contact information because I thought, well, if I'm sending this to the judge and he has follow up questions or we can actually make some movement on this, this would be great. Did well, you, that was a headshot on there too. No, 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 <laughs> no headshot. And anyway, so this letter gets posted and it's one of the first things posted to the public docket. You know, now there are hundreds of files, but it was like one of the first five items or, or something. And so with that, I started getting tons of phone calls and emails. Saying, hey, I've got money in custody. I read your letter to the judge. I completely agree. What that what can we do? And that really springboarded what it what became the entire ad hoc custody group. I started getting in touch with a lot of different people. And relatively early on, I got in contact with uh Gus, who kind of became the counter my counterpart in this group. And luckily for me, he actually lived here in Houston, even though this was a, a group based you know, within the U.S. primarily, but also worldwide, me and the primary other member of this group were like a few miles from each other, and which was pretty incredible. Um, and so we we connected, and very quickly we realized that in order to actually make any meaningful uh, headway in this case, we needed to get legal representation. And so within a few weeks. Um, we started interviewing law firms. I think we ended up interviewing a half a dozen of them, I selected which law firm we wanted to go through. And then what they told us is, hey, if you really want us to represent you, we know you're serious. By the way, it's a $100,000 retainer fee. And so we went on a campaign through Twitter and through Telegram, through emails, et cetera, finding and rallying other members of the custody group who would mind you all just kind of have all their capital locked up and been, you know, put into a Ponzi scheme and then we're reaching out to these guys saying, Hey, can you donate additional capital? I promise this is legitimate. We're hiring an attorney. And so that was really incredible how that happened within 48 hours. Correct me if I'm wrong here, John, but I think within 48 hours, we raised somewhere in the 120,000 range and we're able to secure the law office. Um, and then that really kicked, kickstarted the whole thing. So uh, we continued down that path. We ultimately ended up finding a settlement uh, for all custody members, which was nice. So even though there was a very small, discrete group of people who actually funded the attorneys, um, the resolution that we found ended up extending out to, I think it was over 40,000 creditors. Is that right, John? That is correct. So it was, a, it was ultimately a, a huge win for us, a, a really big uphill climb from the get-go. Um, a, a really big learning experience too, for me, frankly, just understanding how the, the bankruptcy courts work and how in a lot of ways they really don't work towards creditors favors. I mean, there's, I had an, a bankruptcy attorney tell me after the fact, he said, he goes in bankruptcy court 
everybody's a loser just in different shades. And I, and I think that's right. I mean, ultimately there's a huge erosion of, of actual capital just towards the attorneys and time wasted it, and, and yeah, and it ultimately just kind of resolves in a settlement. But from our perspective, I look back and I say, you know, it was a, a tremendous learning opportunity. Uh, it was a lot of stress, but I met some great people throughout the process, learned a lot. And sometimes the most expensive lessons in life are, I'm sorry, the most important lessons in life end up being very expensive lessons. <laughs> so this was that for me too. Hey, we can ask you, so I'm, I had some money on Celsius too, but I was just a, a regular investor. By that, he means he was an urn. He had no, he had no money in custody. Yeah, no custody. Verification. But so a lot of people are familiar with the SBF debacle. He was doing a lot of shady things. But so Celsius, I actually have quite a lot of friends who don't know much about the story. And I'm embarrassed to admit, while I had money on the platform, I don't know exactly what shenanigans they were doing that they shouldn't have been doing. But can you explain a little bit why they got into trouble? Because the one thing about earning return, the way it was explained to me by early on, one of the reasons I love, I love crypto is they said, listen, banks give you at the time they were giving less than a percent, when interest rates were low, they were giving people that leave money at a bank less than 1% return, then they're lending it out at double digit returns. So the beautiful thing about crypto is instead of the banks getting all the money, they can lend out the money and you can get more of a return, maybe 8% and then they take the, the difference or something. So what was Celsius doing that they shouldn't have been doing that got them in trouble? So you're exactly right. What, what they advertised on their website was to say, we are earning yield through over collateralized loans. And what that essentially means is that we're giving loans to institutional partners. And if we lend out, say, 80,000 or, you know, these numbers, $80 million, we have rights to a hundred million dollars worth of assets. So in a case of default there, we're, we're going to, when the financial data ended up actually coming out and people figured out what really happened only around, if I remember correctly, around 3% of what they were being lent out were actually defined by that business model. Wow. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of under collateralized lending. There was a tremendous amount of lending to very inexperienced and, and shady companies. And then there was also probably the most egregious use of customer funds, in my opinion, was Mashinsky and the board decided to sell a, a tremendous amount of users' assets and actually purchase uh, Bitcoin mining machines. And so their thoughts were, well, the, the bull run will continue, the price of Bitcoin will continue to increase we will be able to pay back our customers and then some. But of course, when the price of Bitcoin turned the opposite way, um, that it created a huge hole in the balance sheet. So there was a tremendous amount of, of fraud there. And what they were promising they were doing was a, a very, very small percent, totally meaningless percentage of what it actually turned out to be. And so when, when we came out with the bankruptcy, it was like there was a huge hole in the balance sheet they did have tangible assets, but they never should have had those tangible assets in the first place. And so as the bankruptcy court, as things kind of graded along slowly, of course, the price of Bitcoin was slipping. Those tangible assets were getting depreciated in a rapid manner like Bitcoin miners do. And so that hole just continued to grow and grow and grow. Uh, so it was really, really unfortunate. So, and, but ultimately, just a huge misrepresentation of what they were actually doing. Not to interrupt you, I just want to, just for, for some clarification, if people listen to this, just so they don't feel left out, there were, there were also two other uh, subgroups within that, that creditor bankruptcy. There was the loans group. So those were individuals that actually borrowed against the collateral that they had on the exchange. Yeah. So you basically used your, your crypto as collateral and then you were lent fiat. So money, you know, whatever, in whatever form that was. And you also had another group called Withhold, which was really small, but it was kind of like custody, but not really. Custody, we got very lucky because it was just in a number of states and we had the option to opt into it. So we got an email saying, hey, your state is now requiring us to give you the option to go into custody. Um, the advantage is, is that it's, you're, we're just basically, like you said earlier, we're holding it for you, um, but you can't borrow against and you can't earn yield on it. And I was like, hell, well, absolutely. I mean, less, you know, less risk for me, 
And I don't know, maybe you could borrow against it. I have no idea. But for, at that moment, I decided that I didn't want to take any risk. I put it into custody and that's where it was. But what's really interesting is that it created, if there was a domino effect, the entire crypto market crashed, as everybody knows, and you saw Celsius go first. And there was kind of some hate. People were like shitting all over Celsius, saying FTX, you know, at the time it was the safest place. And why didn't you put your money into <laughs> FTX? And then we saw a domino effect, right? It was kind of like, you just, just things just kerplunking down. So Celsius was first, then you had, I believe, BlockFi, and then it was FTX. And I think in the United States, the only two big exchanges that um, survived, and correct me if I'm wrong, were Coinbase and Kraken. But I don't think people realize the enormous um, historical importance of this bankruptcy. This will be taught, in my opinion, in future legal and finance classes for years to come because it was so incredible. And it, it really actually, th this bankruptcy set the bar, uh, no pun intended, for bankruptcy courts, for attorneys, and um, to identify the rules behind individuals and, uh, you know, crypto assets and ownership and, and really who owns what. And till this date, we're October 2024, the SEC still is not being super clear on what crypto is. But yeah, we, sh we should also uh, advocate here that while we're all big fans of cryptocurrencies, Lawrence, myself, and I don't want to speak for you, David, but we're, we're really fond of Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin yeah. is something that we really believe in. Uh, we think is, is the Godzilla of all the cryptocurrencies and not to minimize or, or diminish anything else. There's some other stuff out there I think has got plenty of uses and it will do well. But um, this, this was just really, really intriguing. Um, and kind of, you know, transitioning on that note with Bitcoin, how did you first get into Bitcoin? Because when you told me what you actually had locked up on that, <laughs> on that exchange, how much money you had in, in Bitcoin, I thought, holy shit, like, I had like, I had like 1% or 2% of what you had on there. And I was like, David is rich. He is rich. He's going to be paying for the rest of this trip. Uh, I just recently, uh, I was hanging out with these guys in Houston recently, but how did you get into Bitcoin and what was the, yeah, what was the catalyst? So it's a pretty interesting story because it was just such a massive schema ship for me. I would say that before I, I studied Bitcoin. Number one, I thought it was a, a total scam and, and just fake internet money. And I'd really subscribed previous to that to the notion of you need to create multiple income streams. And, and for years, as I worked through my engineering job on a, on a full-time basis, I started other ventures and it took me a long time, but ultimately I, I was to the point in 2020 where I, I had seven different income streams. And um, I'd finally kind of achieved that you know, that internal goal that I had. And then 2020 happens. And what we saw was, as we, we can all remember, the, the markets crashed and it, it really every market crashed. It was, it was completely, uh, you know, indiscriminate as to what it was, which is, I thought was very interesting. And I thought to myself, this is probably one of those moments in a lifetime where if you can make the right decision and you can quote unquote, pick the fastest horse in the race, I think you could have a meaningful impact to my net worth. And so I had that thought coupled with a ton of free time, right? So for the oil and gas company that I was, that I worked for as a, a petroleum engineer up until recently, we went from, I think operating 1200 wells to operating all somewhere in like the 15 range. So the operational workload of the day-to-day -day just massively collapsed overnight for the, for the entire oil field, but our, our company was the same, of course. And so I had this newfound mission to find, quote unquote, the fastest horse in the race, also coupled with, for the first time in a long time, a tremendous amount of free time. <laughs> so I, I kind of went down this journey and, and I was looking at all these different asset classes. And my first thought was, you just put in the S&P, you can't go wrong, right? It, it will come back over time. It'll be fine. And, you know, I could get, I could capture a 30% upswing over the next few years, 30, 40% upswing. And then my next thought was, 
uh, tech companies, right? Because essentially my, my thoughts on tech companies were they have a number one, a cash mode around them. They've got hundreds of billions of dollars in the bank. They can, they can weather the storm. And then number two, it was like, well, they're not really part of the overall, you know, consumer trade economy. And then I went down the road of precious metals and gold and potentially silver. And as I'm going down this research, of course, I overlap Bitcoin a few times. And I just had that the natural hesitancy uh, and the aversion towards it, right? It's like, but I thought to myself one day, and this is, keep in mind, this is March, April of, of 2020. And I was like, man, I, and the reality is I don't know anything about this asset class. I couldn't actually answer one technical question about this. And so I thought to myself, I will put 50 hours on the clock and I'm going to just study this asset and prove myself right, right? My thesis at the time was, it's like I said, magic internet. And so I went down that path, ordered several different books, found some really excellent research articles written by um, ARK Invest, uh, Fidelity, Ross Stevens Company, listened to some, tried to listen to just very, very smart people and some podcasts. And I just kind of went down the, the, the rabbit hole, if you will. And when I came out the other side, I didn't go from thinking, okay, this is the made up internet money to saying, okay, this is kind of interesting. Maybe there's something else there. I went from, this is a totally made up fictional asset to realizing that Bitcoin is the apex asset and that there is nothing else I would rather own. And so I had the conversation with my wife and her <laughs> thought at the time where I trust you. It seems really aggressive what you want to do, but I know that you're a smart guy and you do your research and you want the best for this family, so go. And in, in short order, I started, I sold all my rental properties. Um, I refinanced my personal home. I took a loan out on my 401k. I sold all my company stock. Uh, Airbnb's gone. Like Everything was all my royalty interest. Like Everything else in my life was liquidated and put into one asset. And that's still where I, I sit today. You know, now I'm, I'm a very boring investor. I, I have what I, I have. I, I've secured it in, you know, in a multi-custody, multi-sig way in multiple states to where I know that like, I'm just not going to touch it for, you know, maybe a decade, maybe two decades. And I feel the same and, you know, if not more confident today than I did then as this asset has continued to grow. Um, and, and mature over time. David, can I ask you, so was it the f more the philosophy behind the decentralized currency and the fact that it's most people, I don't know if most people are aware, but you hear a lot, um, and I've been spreading the message, since 2020 alone, they've added 40% of US dollars to the money supply. Yeah. I'm sure it's probably yeah. growing by now. But just this ability for the government to debase the currency, you know, since, I think since the 20s, the Persian power of the dollar is locked there, you know, 96% or something crazy. Yeah. And it's, so you don't realize how inflation just becomes expected uh, until you look back. And th there was something I was looking at was that prices in the 1920s, like price of dinner, price of a house, price of a movie, uh, movie ticket, all these different things. And it's so insanely cheap because we just assume that inflation is this natural thing, but it's really not natural. You know, p people like uh, Michael Saylor, it's, you know, it, it, it's not a natural thing. It's not something that is good for the government, which is heavily indebted, but it's bad for us. If we work hard, we save, we have cash dollars, and then we, we lose purchasing power. So was it that, um, was it the idea that, hey, I can make a lot of money from Bitcoin that attracted you when you came out of the other side of the rabbit hole? Or was it more the philosophy or was it all everything wrapped? Like what, what got you by the end of it? What got you so convinced? And what were some of the, I guess, the most important revelations? Because I can tell you with me, it was just one podcast with Anthony Pompiano. And it was just, mm -hmm. I listened to that and it just, it was on Lex Friedman's podcast and it just something clicked. I went from it's silly fake internet money. I ha had this friend of mine from Jiu Jitsu and she's a nurse and she called me when Bitcoin went up to 5,000 the first time it was rallied, probably around 2020. And she said to me, she's like, Orange, should I buy Bitcoin? I know you used to work in finance. And my first thought was, if a nurse no. doesn't own any stock is asking me, then obviously it's worth nothing. But I just didn't do the research. So I think the, the most powerful lesson in this, David, is don't be too attached with your views. We live in a very black and white world when almost any issue is a subtle, nuanced shade of gray. And I think this is a great example of just you re-questioning an assumption that you had about this fake money, and then you actually put the time in, and then you came out the other side. Yeah. 
there are so many threads to pull on what you said there, Lawrence. Uh, I will start with just answering the basic question. Unfortunately, the, the truth of the matter is, it wasn't anything philosophical for me at first. It was literally, how can I increase my fiat net worth in the most rapid manner? Gotcha. Right. And that's what I said. I said, I was just trying to find the fastest horse in the race. The philosophical aspect of Bitcoin is, it is massive. It's very, very pervasive and it's very, very deep. And there's a lot of rabbit trails to go down. But I do feel that that typically comes later. You know, you need to understand first and foremost, the value of the asset first and why it's valuable and why it will go up over time. And then, and then once you've kind of secured that, you know, you learn Bitcoin in layers, then you can kind of peel back the onion and say, okay, that's really interesting. If this asset does take off, off, how does it change energy infrastructure? And then how does it basically change the behavior patterns of consumers? Or, and how does it change government over time? And so there is a huge philosophical aspect to Bitcoin. But for me, initially, I looked at it as um, essentially a tool, right? So my, my engineering background and, uh, and mind frame, I thought, I studied it as an engineering protocol. And I looked back and I re realized, okay, what gives things with monetary, what gives monetary assets value over time? It's certain properties. And why does Bitcoin within that, that context of those properties tend to outperform everything else over time? And then will those base assumptions that has created that, that increase in value, is, are those going to accelerate over time or is that acceleration pretty much done? So I looked at it from an engineering protocol standpoint. Now to speak to that for a second, so I love what you said, and this is something, a, a book I bought early on, a, a book called The Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth. And what he talks about is uh, inflation is not a natural market phenomenon, it's a forced market phenomenon. And the, and the actual um, way that things should go is, is deflation over time. And the easiest example, like just what you said is, you know, a loaf of bread in the 1930s was five cents. <clears throat> a loaf of bread today is three dollars. However, it doesn't cost more to make a loaf of bread in 2024 than it did in 1930. If anything, it's probably dramatically cheaper from a manufacturing standpoint. And so this is what I tell people is that everyone has the wrong framing of money and value. Everyone thinks in, that things get more expensive over time, right? It's actually totally the wrong framing. The reality is that the money that we use as a store of value and as a medium of exchange is being debased year after year after. Things actually get cheaper over time, but the, the dollars that you're using to purchase those things just lose value. So David, that's such a good point. So one thing I've, I've really been thinking about the last few years is, okay, the S&P has done so great the last few years. That has it. Well, it's done really great if you price it in terms of dollars. But if you mm -hmm. price the S&P in terms of gold or in terms of Bitcoin, it's a very different graph. And that's one thing I'm very fond of. What is the ultimate real asset that, that's like bricks and mortar? It's property. So when people talk about a property crash, I always laugh because I think if you price property in terms of a non-fiat currency, I think it's actually really cheap. So like, it's just a different way of looking at things. And a lot of people can't get their head around it. But I think it's so important to see where is real, real value. Well, you have to see what your what you're looking at, you know, how, how you're pricing it. And if you're pricing it in something that's added nearly half in the last four years, it's diluted its value. Then for me, other, other assets seem incredibly cheap, but it's just trying to get your head around that, like getting, getting a traditional graph of something and then pricing it in different things, dollars, gold, Bitcoin will give you three very different graphs. And I think it's a really good thought experiment for everyone to do because it just gives you a different perspective on things. Yeah. I, I love that that you've done that, especially because you see the S&P denominated in other assets and you kind of go like, that's just flat. Like if you look at the S&P and you divide it by M2 monetary growth, it's like, it's just flat. It's just flat for like a hundred years. So I'll, and I'll frame it a different way. Cause I, I thought about when I initially, when I was thinking through this, it, again, this is kind of the engineering, um, my foundation in engineering, but I thought to myself, it's interesting that we use the dollars as a unit of account. Um, because if you think about other units of account, like terms of measurement, right? 
you think of lengths or weights or, you know, densities or masses and things like that. And w- what's interesting about that is, is if I were to say, you know, it's 180 miles from here to Austin, Texas. Well, that's, that statement is true today. And it was true a hundred years ago. Right. And so units of measure in the engineering world do not change. They are always fixed throughout time. And it's because they are fixed throughout time that we can actually make meaningful calculations in the real world. And it's so interesting that the one measurement that we really need to be fixed in order to make proper economic calculations is something that is always changing over time. And so when I looked at it, I was like, man, everyone thinks of the world in terms of USD value. And you hear people say like, oh man, the PE ratio for the stock market is just so overbought right now. And it's like, well, no, like you mentioned, the N2 monetary supply went up 35% in the last four years. Like there are more dollars in the system. Like you, your metrics are broken yeah. because your unit of account is broken. It's like saying, hey, a mile used to be, you know, 5,280 feet, but actually in 2020, in 2020, we decided that it's 7,100 feet. It just throws everything else off. And that's what people don't realize about dollars. They have this mentality of, well, they're just fixed throughout time. But if you go back and you look at it and you'd say, well, what happened since you know the 1920s? It's been on average an annual increase in M2 monetary supply of about 7 8%, which is funny because what's the average return of the S&P 500? Like 7 8%. I was going to say, David, it's, it's funny. My mom's fiance is a, is a really, really, really smart guy. He was like Lawrence. He worked at the board of trade here in Chicago. He was a commodities trader. He uh, owns a lot of farmland in, in central Illinois, which is considered the best soil, by the way, in the world. Central Illinois. I didn't know. I mean, he could talk your ear off for hours. He works closely with the, <laughs> the University of Illinois and they have a huge agricultural um, you know, school there. And so he works with engineers, but he's extremely smart. He's very well learned, like, like you two. And you guys could talk for hours about this. He's, he's a, a student of economy, but I always like to ask people that I find really intelligent, simple questions, because I may not understand all the technical things that they're speaking about, but I can understand, I can extract or distill what they're saying in a, in a, <laughs> by asking simple questions. And so I said, Mike, what's the one thing, if you were my age, you know, I, he's got about 35 years, 30, 35 years on me. I said, if you could go back in time and when you started to earn real money, what's the one thing that you wish you had known then that you know now? And without missing a beat, he said, I wish I had accounted more for inflation. That's what he said. And I just thought that was really interesting because unlike you and Lawrence, you know, you've got a background in engineering. You're, you're, you're also, you know, well-learned in finance. Lawrence has a background, a very profound background of finance and which translates to real estate for what he does. But I just think it's, it's really, really interesting in, in kind of talking about engineering, I Recently had the chance to come visit you and Gus in Houston, which was awesome. And for all the people out there that don't know, Texas um, is one of the the big oil, one of the big oil states in the United, well, I should say in the country, and especially the, the Houston area, Galveston, all that stuff. I don't know much about oil. I hear the terms, I'm, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that you hear the term fossil fuel, you, you hear the t- term fracking a lot thrown out in the media. This is like this big contentious thing now, like even with the presidential election going on at the moment, Pennsylvania fracking. I don't know shit about oil. I thought oil was a bunch of dinosaurs that were compressed. And you were like, no, bro, it's a lot of it's biomass, a lot of it's plants. But, and then you told me a little bit about how the extraction process goes with oil and how intricate it, and it just blew my mind. So backing up a little bit, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you got into such a unique job field and, and what it entailed and kind of your thoughts on fossil fuels. And also just that crazy time when oil went negative. So I was just listening yeah. to an audio book about that. So basically from the way I understand it, you get paid just to take delivery and then just yeah. hold it. And if you wait, these oil traders are making fortunes, but it's a huge pain in the ass. You know, you're going to hold all this oil. Yes. 
So I'd love to hear a bit more about that too. So I got into it. Uh, I wish I had a better story. I guess it's a little funny how I got into it. All your stories are great, David. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so I actually went to college as an 18-year-old, like I feel like most 18-year-olds, and had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, I speak Spanish. And so I went in with uh, just international studies major. I went to Texas a and University. And as I was coming in, my sister was coming out with that same major. So it was like, I speak Spanish. He just, he did this major. That's fine. But a semester in, as I was working through my, you know, my, my classes, my sister's looking for her first job and the job opportunities that she was getting were, you know, just not enough money to even support a family. I mean, we're talking, you know, 30, $40,000 a year type job offers. And so I realized really early on, I needed to pivot. Obviously, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I called my dad towards the end of the first semester. So this would be 2005. And I basically expressed to him like, Dad, I just need to earn more money when I come out. Uh, what should I major in? <laughs> and he said, uh, David, you should go be a petroleum engineer because every China man wants a moped. I thought I said, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, I don't really know what that means, dad, but all right, I trust you. Let's go. So, uh, I applied and, uh, you know, four years later, graduated petroleum engineering and it, it's a great industry. Uh, you know, it's a phenomenal industry and it wor- I worked in it for 15 years as a, as a petroleum engineer. I worked with a really great company, uh, called EOG resources and they're known as they're called the Apple of the oil field. Uh, just one of the best companies, one of the best operators. And it was a really, really great experience up until recently when I jumped off uh, to do my own venture. But to to kind of dive into a few of the comments that you guys made, it's it's really interesting. The, the oil and gas industry and the energy industry, it, it drives the whole world. Anything that you come across in your daily life that you use is only possible because of, you know, you know, directly or indirectly through the oil field. So I don't think that the oil and gas industry will be phased out anytime soon. I actually view the, the world as we move forward as the best thing we can do is just create an abundance of energy. And I make that statement completely agnostic as to the type of energy that it's going to come from. I think that all energy input sources are going to have to increase because one undeniable fact is that as you make energy cheaper and more abundant, it is one of, if not the largest driving force into prosperity for civilizations. And so the reality is, and a lot of people don't realize this, but, you know, close to I believe a, a billion people still, even more than a billion people, still use fire as their primary heating source. And what I mean to say there is that there is still pervasive energy poverty throughout the world. Mm. We don't see it because we live in a first world country, but the best thing that we can really do to drive civilization forward is to create an absolute ton of low cost energy and distribute that to, to people all across the world. And so as I worked through the petroleum engineering uh, job and my career, that to me, what I, when I realized that, that became one of, my, one of my whys, is I thought this is actually something that's making people's lives better. And I'm, I'm a very small cog in this wheel, but you, you magnify all these efforts in, 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 in a meaningful way, it could impact uh, people's lives. What, what about when, were you, so were you in the business when oil went negative? Were you still in, in the business? Yeah. So the blip of the negative thing was a little bit more of a taking physical settlement of, of barrels of oil. So, you know, because technically speaking, like commodities really can't go negative, but from a trading perspective, it did go negative because essentially we caught a, a, a small discrete time frame in which you had to pay people to take delivery of actual crude assets. And so that's one, that's one thing that, interesting about the oil and gas industry is that when you create a contract and, you, and you're doing a purchase contract, you have to take physical delivery. And refining 
uh, companies only have a finite amount of storage. And so there was a time where it went. So it is it kind of a bit of a, a, a silly finance metric that was that, that caught that blip. But I mean, y'all remember oil, oil was incredibly low for several, several months. And the entire oil field responded by essentially looking at all the producing wells that they had figuring out what the marginal cost to produce those wells was going to be and what that price of oil was, and then shutting wells down that didn't meet that, uh, that manner. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I remember when that happened and I, was, the, was there an opportunity for people who, obviously there's an opportunity if you're, if you're in that industry and you have the capacity to store huge amounts and then wait for the prices to, to rise when the world economy opens up, was there a place for people like John and I, who are just, you know, trading online or something? Was there a place to make money during that time? Because I remember thinking there has to be a huge opportunity at the time, but I just didn't know what it was. I think the opportunity, and you would have had to have been very strategically positioned to this, but if you had, let's say, a fleet of oil tankers that you could have taken delivery on, you could have just held them and either you either just A, a holding them and knowing that generally the price is going to move back up over time, or B, um, you could have potentially hedged that with like a futures contract. But for us as individual traders, you know, we, the best thing that you probably could have done is kind of is essentially a levered bet on that. And it would have been buying a small cap oil and gas company that when you looked at some of these, these operators, you know, like Centennial as an example, they, their market cap lost 90% in that window. And so a really good strategy for somebody at that point in time would have just been to say, I'm just going to buy a bunch of small cap oil and gas operators, hope that none of them go bankrupt and they can kind of weather the storm. And then progressively, as these prices start moving up and their market cap normalized to you know, more median values than offload them. So that would have been a great strategy. And it, it is kind of a leveraged strategy too, because you're not betting on the commodity itself. You're, you're basically betting on you know, something downstream of the commodity. Yeah. which would be that operator. David, so you said something that I feel is really important and that most of the world probably knows, either through firsthand experience or they've heard about it. Lawrence and I are travelers. We've been fortunate enough to travel the world and we've been to third world countries. And I know that you have also, and that you are a traveler. I have been to countries where uh, electricity is not stable and that there's periods of time throughout the day where electricity goes out. It's not very common. I haven't been a lot of places where that's the issue because even if I'm staying in a country where that is common, the resort or the hotel or wherever I'm staying yeah. has their own sort, you know, whatever type of that generation they yeah. use. So I don't, I don't personally, but I've been in restaurants and I've seen it happen. My question is, and I don't want to get too much, you know, get too political here, but it almost seems like they're like with, with anything political or any, any sort of commodity, like energy is, is, is some sort of commodity, right? It seems like we have the ability or we're already at the tipping point where the entire world could have access to energy, but correct me if I'm wrong, how much of the lack of even distribution or at least amicable, excuse me, distribution is related to corruption and large companies who are withholding? How much of it has to do with essentially profit? Gosh. And if it's, if that's too much, if that, if that's, (laughs) if that's a little too esoteric and you don't want to go there, I I just, I'm just wondering if there are like, you know, we could talk about the wars in the Middle East and Halliburton and why things, you know, went the way they went. Like these governments are controlling, right? A lot of these governments that have authority, you know, that have dictatorships or, or, or they're, I hate to say it, socialist or communist. I feel like that, that these energy companies are really skimming off, you know, the top and that, that the leaders are also, you know, withholding things. So how do you think that all kind of intertwines and intersects in relation to money? So if you look at the United States from an energy growth perspective, based on the uh, energy reserves that we have versus the energy output, we're arguably you know, one of the most efficient uh, countries in the whole world. And so what really drives that? Well, in my opinion, you have a uh, personal property ownership. You know, U.S. citizens can actually own mineral rights in the United States, which is a very rare thing when you look at 
uh, the global landscape. You have a deregulated government, generally speaking, compared to other uh, countries. And then you have innovative private companies that are that are capitalistic and competing to generate value. And so if you don't have one of those things, and some countries don't have any of those three things, it's really hard to efficiently produce it. And I'll speak specifically to oil and gas reserves. It's really hard to really specifically uh, produce oil and gas reserves. And I'll give you kind of an anecdotal example. During the last two years of my tenure at uh, EOG Resources, I worked on the international team and we were trying to find an international asset that would compete with some of our domestic assets in the company. And it was really eye-opening to me just how hard these governments make it to actually uh, exploit their natural oil and gas reserves. Um, as an example, we were looking in um, some, you know, we, we were looking in Canada, we were looking in some South American countries, we we're looking in the Middle East, and something from a permitting standpoint, I'll give you an example, and even in Australia, the permitting time in Australia to, to do a well was going to be close to a year. In Texas, you're talking weeks. And so you can make a business decision in Texas, get it through the regulatory approval and begin drilling the well within a matter of weeks. And you wouldn't even have made it to like the first court in, in Australia until, you know, maybe six months down the road. And so that's an example of like really great natural resources. They have a tremendous amount of natural gas and offshore developments as well. But because of the regulatory environment, it's just going to be nearly impossible to actually pr produce those assets. So I think that generally speaking, the world has a lot more energy than we're, we're currently actually uh, exploiting. Primarily the source of those inefficiencies of government in one capacity or the other. But that will have to change over time. I mean, we, we're going to have to change our mind on uh, nuclear. We're going to have to build out more renewables. The oil and gas industry is going to continue to be a huge uh, chunk of the energy mix. And so I think over time, those things will, will have to change because the energy consumption globally is only going up and to the right. Um, we live in the United States, and so and we hear so much verbiage about, hey, we're lowering our emissions, we're flat, you know, flat on our energy consumption. And if you ever see a plot of, uh, and we use emissions as a proxy for energy, even though it's not perfect, but if you ever look at a plot, we'll just say energy, of energy usage in G7 countries versus energy usage in Africa, China, and India, one is relatively plateaued and the others are skyrocketing upwards. Because, you know, guess what? We use industrialization and a lot of fossil fuel energy to move ourselves to a first world country to increase our standard of living. And who are we to tell these other countries like, hey, you're not able to use these cheap energy sources. We understand you're trying to get out of poverty, but we're willing and we want to force these renewables down on you. My perspective is like, you should use every energy source that you have there domestically within your own sovereign right to move your population you know, up the socioeconomic ladder. I really love what you said about just the, um, the bureaucratic, uh, slow, you know, permitting example, how it slows everything down. Most people don't know the U S government was something like two or 3% of the economy in the 1930s. And now it's, you know, 35, 40. And that's why I'm a huge fan of Vivek Ravaswamy because he's one of yeah. the ones saying we have to just cut this down and be more efficient. I'd love to, you, you mentioned something right when you started talking, you mentioned having seven, new, seven different revenue streams. So. I, I sell a lot of real estate to investors. And one of the things that I talk about is most, most of the wealthy have an average of seven revenue streams. I don't know if you read that and that was why yeah, that was your yeah. goal, but that, that's amazing. <laughs> and I'll tell you a personal story. When I was just before I turned 30, I was a amateur fighter and I, I was worth a few million dollars from trading. I had all this money and I lived in a one bedroom condo. I didn't have a car and I had this dream. I was like, you know, I have a lifetime to make money. That I have a very small window to pursue fighting professionally. So I took five years off and I was trading a little bit, but in my head, I was thinking when I'm done, I'm going to walk back on the, in the 10 year bond pit option pit where I was making all this money. I know all the guys, I'm very good at what I do. I'm going to walk back in my spot 
and probably there'd be some guy in there. I'm going to kick him out and I'm going to, I'm going to keep printing all this crazy money. What I didn't want was <laughs> it didn't matter how profitable that revenue stream was in the last few years I was trading. When I left, high frequency trading came in. The era of the small market maker groups was no longer. And, um, and that revenue stream dried up. And that, that's such a good lesson for if, if you're really, really wealthy, really good at what you do and you make all this money, especially the, the world we live in now where things change so quickly, that revenue stream can dry up. And if you don't have several different revenue streams, you get in real trouble. So I'd love to talk a little bit about what, what were some of those revenue streams and how you went about that and how you even wanted that as a goal, because it's such a smart goal. And it's one that I wish I had when I was younger. When I, when I was making all this money, I didn't realize when I was young, I didn't realize it was two very distinct and separate skills, making money and preserving wealth. Because to oh, make yeah. you, you get paid to do some kind of skill that provides value, and it can be anything. But maintaining wealth is a completely separate set of skills. And I wish I'd known a bit more of what I know now then. But um, yeah, how, how did you come to that goal of having seven revenue streams? Uh, very similar to what, to what you just said. You know, essentially, you study the rich and, and they have diversified assets. You know, they don't have, they, they minimize exposure into one different segment. The thing that I didn't realize at the time is I was studying people who had already made a ton of money mm -hmm. and their primary goal was capital preservation. My goal instead, what I realized needed to be capital accumulation. Yes. So it's that concept, first and foremost, coupled by the, the rule of 72, which basically is a, is a quick back of the napkin calculation that says if you take 72 divided by the average interest rate of your investments, that equals the number of years you need to, do to double your money. And what I realized, I said, man, if I'm on average with these seven revenue streams making, call it 7% a year, that means I'm doubling my net worth every 10 years. And that's just not very fast. So it really is. It's not a capital accumulation game. It's a capital preservation game. So what I had at the time was, um, you know, I had in my W two income job, I had my other company, Crown Capital Resources, which I'm now doing full time. I had uh, dividends. I had royalty interest from uh, natural gas wells. I had invested it in the Uinta, uh, Airbnb uh, income, and then uh, rental portfolio as well, just single family homes, long term tenants. But yes, when I had that that shift into Bitcoin. You know, so if you take a look at that, I'd say like in the context of Bitcoin specifically and trying to find the fastest course, I realized I'm playing this capital maintenance game and I'll double this capital in seven to 10 years. But you, as everyone knows here on this podcast, you'd say like, well, with an asset like Bitcoin, I could double my money within a few months. I mean, it, it, it is wildly volatile in the shorter term, but longer term. It just goes up and to the right programmatically. So that's what I realized. I, my mind shift is I'm in capital accumulation mode. And you can do that two ways. You can do that through active means, which I'm now doing fully through my company. And I think that's the quote unquote, the fastest way you can do it on an active perspective. And then I have basically my passive portfolio, which is Bitcoin, which I still believe that's the best, fastest course in the race. David, on that, can we segue yeah. a little bit over to the new company that you, you, you're now, I should say not new company, but you've transitioned, you've, you've built up one of your income streams enough that you were able to transition from the longtime job you had as a petroleum engineer and are now doing Crown Capital full time. And it's really interesting that Morris and I, because we're both in real estate, um, you're obviously in Texas, we're in Illinois. But one thing that I think uh, is similar, I, I believe that, you know, you and I talked and I know that at certain times you were working long hours and you have a, you have a wife, you have daughters and dad time was not there. It just wasn't, it, you were, you, I think were able to buy some of your time back by transitioning out of your, your W2 job. And then, and then now you are essentially um, a co-partner in this company, if I'm not correct, but can you tell me a little bit more, tell us a little bit more about what your company Crown Capital does, and then also a little bit more about how that impacts your family time and what benefits, 
uh, that that brings you. Because whenever you're going into something new, there's always a little bit of uncertainty. But I think having talked to you about this, the payoff is is going to be huge. I, yes, I would love to talk about this. It just been such a pivotal shift and, and a positive change in my life here in the last six months. To, to give a little bit of context and background, um, like I mentioned, I'd worked for an engineering firm as a petroleum engineer for, for 15 years. Now, in that time, I had done other ventures which were generating revenue streams. And, and one of them was we, me and my business partner, his name is Jeremy. And Jeremy and I started this hard money lending company. And we'll get into some details on that in a second. But essentially, we ran this business just on nights and weekends since 2017. So this was always going on along with the full-time role. And, and then about six months ago, the, 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 the quote-unquote side hustle had grown and started eclipsing the main job. And we'll get into it. I'd love to just expand on it more a little bit later, but there was a lot of personal reasons that I realized why this was such a great decision for me, um, both from a family standpoint and for me personally. But also the other check that I needed was I needed to know that financially it made sense too. But, but what the business model essentially is, and, and um, I'll give that story on how it started actually. Jeremy, Adrian, and myself, my business partner and co-founder, we had done different real estate ventures separately for several years so we're both we were both engineers at eog resources uh we had done different ventures in real estate and then we came together and decided that we wanted to flip a house so this is 2017 and we were taking our lunch hours and going and visiting properties making offers and we just kept getting denied and sometimes it'd be we did the the wholesaler events where you go out there everyone has 10 minutes to look at a house you go and we flip cards on the hood of a, a vehicle we did that and we went for months and we, we just couldn't acquire a property. <laughs> and um, we had a friend of ours call us up and say, hey guys, I got a contract on a property it's closing in 10 days. Can you guys fund this for us? And uh, I told Jeremy, I said, you know, I actually uh, participated as a passive investor in a hard money loan, you know, about a year ago. I think I can dig those contracts up and, and we can do this. So that was our first hard money loan. We we lent him the money, he put the property, sold it, we got paid back, made good interest on it. And we we had the realization with that, man, out of everything that we're doing kind of on the side, this was the most the most easily maintainable with a W-2 schedule. And by that I mean and you guys know if you have a renter and their AC breaks down in the middle of a Texas summer, you can't text them back and say, Hey, sorry, I'm in this engineering meeting. Like, I'll give you a call later today. Like, do you have to pick up the phone? <laughs> and so it's hard to be totally passive. But what we found with the hard money lending company was that the requests that came through, they could, all those requests could be done, you know, after work hours, there was nothing just immediately impressing. And so we, ba- we slowly grew that company over time. Uh, very, very slowly initially. It was just our own funds for several years, almost the first five years. And for us, it was just a passive means to grow our own personal capital. We were making around 20% annualized returns on, on the business. And so it was a really, really great venture. And then in 2021, we I was living in New Mexico. I got transferred back to Texas. He was living in Colorado, got transferred back to Texas which is where all our business was. And he called me up and said, you know, I think we should kind of try to grow this business a little bit. And we started putting a concerted effort into um, spending more time on at night and more time on the weekends and growing out the business. And another material shift that we had was instead of using our own capital, we started bringing on third party passive capital. And I feel like this is probably a very common story, but it went just like you'd expect. You know, initially it was, your parents they're putting in more money they're investing alongside you and then it was other family members and then it was friends and so that number grew and grew grew over time and over the next three years from you know 2021 to 2023 we had a massive growth and so to put numbers to that essentially from 2017 to 2021 we went from 400,000 to a million in AUM. So just a very, very just low growth. 
And then from 2021, we went from sub a million to today uh, at 18, uh, no, I'm sorry, this, as of this morning, 19.1 million in AUM. So if you were to visually like look at that line graph, it's just this, this very, very slow plateau and then just they just scream mm-hmm. up. And for us, it was a, from an, I'm a numbers guy. And for me, it was like, oh, this is financially becoming a big boy business. This is real. <laughs> and then there were a lot of things that happened personally too, where I realized that, that this is undoubtedly the right path for me and for my family going forward to resign from the engineering job and to pursue this full time. Yeah. Take back your time. D- David, can I ask you, so in yeah. two, two questions. 20% return seems kind of high. Is that normally like hard money that I'm dealing with in Chicago is, is probably between 14 and 16%. So is that because you have a, there's fees associated with that? I guess that was the first thing. And then what about, um, have you, have you dealt with much default risk where if someone gets in real trouble and they're, they're halfway through a project and they just like, I want to walk away, do you take back the property, get someone to finish it and get your money back that way? Or, or how does that work with defaults? Yeah, so let me quantify the 20%. When, when the capital is all your own, right, and you're not paying third-party capital partners, the rates that we charge in Texas are uh, 12% interest and three points origination. Oh, gotcha, okay. And so uh, essentially, you have that capital deployed throughout the year, so you're making 12% on that capital, but these are short-term projects. So those are three to five-month projects, which is typically what we fund we're able to capture that 3% origination to ideally three times a year. Gotcha. So that's where that 12% baseline interest becomes closer to 20%. Because the 12% is annualized. So if it's a six that's month project, they're paying 6%. That's correct. Gotcha. Well, they would be yeah paying six, 12% for six okay. months. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so when we draft up, even today, when we draft up um, loans, for people who are out flipping houses and whatnot, we draft them up max term length of six months, which let me give, because there's, I know there's a lot of um, listeners thinking, I don't know what hard money lending is. So to give you just a quick one minute primer on what hard money lending is and what we do, essentially there's a huge market of uh, real estate professionals who are out flipping houses, revitalizing properties, stabilizing properties that need non-traditional finance. And so a lot of what our loan product offers in very little, and there's almost no overlap between what a bank offers. And so the target uh, client for us is imagine a, I'm out, I flip properties for a living and I need somebody to help me deploy. I need somebody who's willing to invest in my project so I can purchase this property, I can renovate the property, and then I can put it back on the market. And so what we do is we typically lend out 60 to 70 cents on the dollar and in six month terms, and people are able to use our capital to essentially use it as leverage to magnify the number of properties that they're doing. So to give you kind of a a simple example, if I'm a full-time flipper and let's say I have $400,000 cash, the reality is in today's market, that means I can flip one house at a time. So what people instead choose to do is they use lenders like ourselves and they say, well, I'll put 60,000 in each property, right? And now I'm able, and then, you know, have some money for reserves and renovations. And now I'm able to do four to five properties at a time. And so it increases your top line at the end of the year. But what it also does is, you know, you get efficiency from economies of scale as well, right? So now I'm looking out and I'm thinking, well, I've got a basis of design for these properties. I'm going to go out and instead of buying 3,000 square feet of foreign, I can go out and buy 15,000 square feet of flooring. I can keep crews running more efficiently and effectively, which means I keep better contract workers. And so that's the service that we provide. We, we, and then there's, there's other things that are subsets within that, you know, bridge lending, somebody saying, I can, if I put a cash offer on this property, I can get a great deal on it. And I just need three months of money for the bank to be able to fully underwrite it. And I'll get long-term financing of the bank. So we, that would be what you'd probably coin more as a like bridge lending. Uh, but we do all of that. And um, so, so that's, that's the primer on hard money lending. But the, the beauty of it is if you're out lending um, as a composite right now, it, our average loan to value across our entire portfolio is 63%. So if you've got 63 cents on the dollar 
on a property that you own a first lien position in, it's a really, really low risk manner to deploy capital. And then speaking specifically to your question, we've had a really low default rate. In seven years, we, we had our first official foreclosure um, two months ago on, on August 6th. That's okay. And yeah, it's, it's been really good. And part of that's probably because Jeremy and I, as engineers, we're very conservative. In, in how we lent the capital out and how we underwrite. Um, but this was a case where we had to take the property over. The guy missed his extension fees and didn't communicate with us. We sent a demand letter. And in Texas, it's a very, very quick process. From demand letter to the foreclosure, it's, it's 53 days for us. Um, and since they're defined as investment properties and non-owner occupied, there's no homestead exemptions or anything that you have to deal with. So uh, we took over the property. Uh, got, got in there with the contractor, had to had to put some work into it just to finish it up and put it back on the market. We got uh, multiple offers and we're closing on it on October 31st. So, you know, it wasn't a financial burden going through the foreclosure. It was honestly, just looking back on it, just more of a pain in the ass. Yeah. But that's the thing. I mean, if you underwrite conservatively and, and if you hold a first lien position on, a, on an over collateralized asset, and you're taking it over from a financial perspective, you're going to be fine. Yeah. It's just like doing the things that we don't want to do, right? We got it because we're not flippers. Yeah. And so we got to go find the contractors. We got to go put the utilities in our name. We got to go. Do, so for us, it was, it was an inconvenience, but it ultimately like, it was good to go through your forced foreclosure because like the Celsius thing where you say, it's like, these are expensive lessons and that's okay. <laughs> Yeah, and then we should we should let the listeners know that I'm gonna throw you under the bus. I always do with any guests that I've been a co-host on. But your wife, with all that Bitcoin you had tied up, I think you had the, <laughs> the majority of your net worth on the yeah, exchange yeah. frozen. And I don't <laughs> did you, your wife like were you were you weren't you terrified to tell her? Because I would have been scared shitless. Well, I told her. I remember I was sitting in the kitchen. And I told her what had happened and. And I remember when I first put money into Celsius, she was hesitant to do so. And I, and I kind of told her what was happening. And I said, I think we're in custody. I think we're okay. And she just said, you know what, David, not your keys, not your cheese. That's all she said. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, man. That must uh, be. But yeah, that's, uh, that, it was, you know, John, looking back, I mean, it was. It was certainly a very, very stressful time in, in, in our lives, you know, having those assets tied up and, and the uncertainty associated with that. I, but yeah, then that was a long process too. Uh, I'll tell you a similar story. I had some Bitcoin on the last highs and then it went, when it went all the way down with all this stuff going on with Celsius, I think the low was, what, what was the low in Bitcoin? 14, 16, it was 15, something. 16, five, yeah, yeah. Right about 16. Okay. I remember, so it went all the way down. And I had to sell a bit on the low because we, we found a dream home. And we're like, like oh, wow. you know, it, it's, I don't, I don't mind. I'm still happy. I'm so happy with that house. I'm so happy um, we did it. But that was kind of painful. And then we were doing yeah. a full rehab before we moved. And I had an investment property that I sold that I had the cash. And I was like, I want to put it all back in Bitcoin because I think it's going to go back up. And she was like, baby, are you sure about this? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, she wasn't happy, but she's like, okay. And that one did okay. So I, I've traded Bitcoin many times. I've done well, I've done badly, but the, I, I don't regret doing anything. Like I, I think I'm, I might, I could, my, things can change, but I might die in this house. We absolutely love it. You know, so things yeah. like that, like what are you doing? What are you doing investments for? You're doing it for your future, but sometimes yeah. life changes and you, you can't miss opportunity costs. And I don't mind paying for that. Um, but it's just, it's so interesting that I think, I think finances is one of the biggest reasons. I think finance and infidelity are the two biggest reasons why for divorces. And one of our mutual friends, he told me his, his the reason for his divorce was he's the way he said it, financial infidelity. That was a uh, carry with his uh, ex oh, It's uh, it's like she she was like an addictive shopper behind his back and yeah. she'd bring up all these credit card bills. And if something as a kid, I would never have even thought that would be an issue. But in a good marriage for me, you divide and conquer as a partner. So if in, for, I come from a finance background, she's a therapist. She's like, okay, you handle the finances. I'm going to run the house like a tight ship. You know, that I, I give her a bit more leeway on parenting. I have my opinion, but I think she's, you know, she studied early childhood development. So I'm like, okay, she knows more about raising kids than me. So like that's, that should be a good marriage, divide and conquer. But at the same time, when you do things like what you did, 
you had all those revenue streams, you go all in on Bitcoin on this exchange. I mean, that is very stressful, but it's exactly what, um, I think it was Peter Lynch that said it, but I might be wrong. It's like, put all your eggs in one basket and then watch that basket like a hawk. And it's like, that's what you have to do. I'm so glad you made that distinction. You had your seven revenue streams that was, and then you realize like, this is wealth preservation, but I'm in a, I'm in a wealth accumulation phase in my life. So I have to be more aggressive and that's what you have to do. And I think too many people want all the upside without the risk. And all of, all three of us have been in the situation where we've had the negative effects of risk. And I think a lot of people that won't have, they haven't had the downsides of risk are never going to have the upside of the appreciation. So I think it's a really, I'm really glad you made that distinction. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It was, it was meaningful to me to understand that and then help for me to make that shift. And David, I always, you know, like to ask successful people, it, it, it's rare that someone of your age, especially when you started the seven income streams, a lot of people at that age are living paycheck to paycheck, even if they're making good money, right? So we live in a big city, Lawrence and I, and it's expensive. And I know you live in a big city and it can be very expensive. You know, do you, do you have an emotional attachment to money or was the goal self-preservation? Was it thinking about your family's future? And where did you find the drive? Because I'm going to be very honest with you. I love the idea of being very wealthy, but at my core, I'm very lazy. So I am very good at certain things and I, I will always do something if I'm motivated to do it, but I don't have the drive to go out and put time and effort into something that I'm not at least relatively convinced that it will pay off. But what I see is a lot of, a lot of times people who are successful or people that you know, start a venture that turns out to become very successful. A, they fail often. They try many things and they have a lot of failures. And B, there's no guarantees at the very beginning that, that whatever their project is, is going to take off. So how did you like, Yeah. what was the balance there? And David, let me just add to that. So you, you had a family and you, you're obviously successful in your day job as an engineer and you have all these revenue streams, but you still, even just with your um, crown capital, with the hard money lending, you still took the time to, like you said, to work evening and weekends. So you're, you're very driven. And um, I think that's, I always like to emphasize that because too many people want the rewards of a rich lifestyle without putting that kind of work in. And you had every excuse to, to stop at your day job and your family and you, you put the extra time and effort in and took the extra risk to do something else. So, but what, like, yeah, so, yeah. The, what, what well, was the motivator? So Lawrence, uh, let me, let me key off on, on Lauren's, the Lawrence comment first, and then I'll jump into yours, John, because I think this was a really huge shift for me that I want to really take the time to walk through. The, the way in which, oh, hold on, we're going to edit it here for a second, guys. No, Lawrence, what was your question? I'm totally, I'm thinking through John. What was your, your, your like, Lawrence? Too many people want the rewards of a wealth. Ah, okay. The so, effort. And you, you had a family, you had a day job, and you still took the extra effort to you have a, a really good work ethic, right? John was just saying he's yeah, he's, he's, got, he's got a fucking ins- he's yeah. his. I'm lazy. I'm not really. I'm <laughs> I'm 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 not late. I am okay. 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 I'm with you now. So so to Lawrence to your comment, uh, it's really interesting, kind of being on the other side and having a great business and being able to step away from a high paying W two job. And a lot of the comments that I get are like this was an overnight success or this was something that just happened. And I think that my story, probably like most people's story is like, you're looking at the tip of the iceberg sitting up over water and you're not realizing that 80, 90% of that mass is unseen and underappreciated because, you know, I think through it and it's like, man, yeah, this was, it is something that's now supporting my family and it's a great business and I'm so proud of it. But it took almost a decade of sacrifice to get there. And so that, that's one thing that people always got to remember. You know, people are always sitting in, looking at uh, across the board at, at people who are sitting in the eighth inning and they're in the first inning and they're comparing themselves. And what I always tell people is just, you know what, like you don't know, number one, it's going to be way more work than you think it's going to be. It's going to take longer than you think it's going to be, but you just have to take the steps and start doing it. Now, John, to jump into yours, because this is really interesting. 27-year-old David, so 10 years ago, cared about one thing. And it was 
making as much money as possible. That's the honest to God truth. I was in the corporate job and my goal was to climb the corporate ladder as fast and as high as I could possibly get. And when companies asked me to transfer to a different state, I was there the next week. When they asked me to make sacrifices, the reality was, was that my family was an afterthought and the company was my first thought. And I thought that if I played the game well enough, I did good engineering work. I avoided the bureaucratic landmines that inevitably come about in, in the corporate world, uh, that I could climb to that upper echelon and make the multiple millions a year and, and, and live that life. And that's how I operated for the majority of my career. Um, I did, however, had the opportunity, I believe it was late 2020, uh, to sit down and have dinner with uh, one of the executives of our company. And it was an intimate dinner. There was only three of us there. It was him, my boss, and myself. And when I looked at this man on the hill, he had the position that I was striving for. And I thought if I just make the family sacrifices, the personal sacrifices, and I worked that hard, like I could be that person. I could have that role. And we went through dinner and I asked him, I said, tell me what your, just tell me what your schedule looks like for the year. What, what is, you know, what does being in this role really look like? And he walks through in detail. The first thing he said, is he's like, I will, first thing first, I travel like 35 weeks a year. My schedule is pre-planned for me a year ahead of time. I actually have six weeks vacation, but I can barely take 10 days. You know, it comes out that he misses a lot of his kids' games, and he's just not there. And he's going on and on about this detail uh, in a very neutral way, not, not feeling bad for himself, just objectively telling me what life was like, right? And I realized that it is not a life I want to live. I realized that for me personally, that is not something I wanted to strive for. And, I, and it was just like, a, it just clicked for me. I said, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that. And the amount of personal sacrifice that I would have to do, and by personal, I really mean my family, because uh, they're truly the ones that are sacrificing. It's just not worth it. And so huge shift for me um, uh, several years ago. And I realized that money and title are really not that important. And so it really got me going down the road of thinking through what's, what is the most important thing to me? And what I eventually got to was the autonomy to create, to control my own time. And what I realized was the only, that, that no matter how good of a W2 job you have, you will never have that because your time is not your own. And so these realizations in a lot of ways coincided very serendipitously to the growth in our company, Crown Capital Resources as well, because I realized that that through Crown Capital Resources, I could take control of my time and I could achieve really what I wanted to achieve as now, you know, a 37 year old, which was I could control my own time. And what that also means is to say, that doesn't mean not work. Uh, that doesn't mean, you know, I can just go sit on a beach and I'm retired. For me, that means I can prioritize the things that I want to do in the job. I can prioritize my family. And I think about the next few decades of being able to live in that manner. And it's, it's honestly kind of the best life that you could live. So 27-year-old David was, I want to make as much money as possible. 37-year-old uh, David says, I want to control my time. It was a huge shift for me and a big journey to get there. But you know, Crown Capital for me is a great company that I'm super proud of. But ultimately, like a lot of things, it's just it's just kind of a tool to for me to maximize the time with my family, to make my employees' lives better, to generate value in the real world. But it's it's just a means to achieve those goals. The goal isn't uh, the primary goal isn't capital accumulation anymore. So it's so interesting. I would give any young person the advice to work extra hard and give yourself options. Because if you hadn't given yourself the option of building a second company, it, you wouldn't have had the, the availability to leave that job. When he was, two things, David, when he was talking, he said he wasn't feeling sorry for himself. He was just kind of like explaining his life. 
was was he almost realizing that my life kind of sucks even though I have all this money? So, so no, not at all. In fact, and this is what I thought also as he was going through this, I thought to myself, he's all in. He wakes up and as he's brushing his teeth, he's thinking about the airman's call. And as he's brushing his hair, he's thinking about the next quarterly review. And he's putting his pants on, he's thinking about the shareholder meeting he's got coming up. I think in order to be a public officer in a company, in a, you know, call it a Fortune 100 company, a Fortune 500 company, you have to be all in. Otherwise, you're just in a miserable existence. So it wasn't that. And I don't think he was, I don't think he was regrettably talking through it. I don't think he was realizing it. I think for him, it's the path that he's chosen. And that's fine. Because I mean, yeah, there's a lot of prestige with being able to say I'm a CEO. And and it is really nice to live in like the, the nicest neighborhoods in, you know, in Houston. There, there's a lot of pros with that, but the costs are high as well. Well, when you were 27 and you were saying like your one goal was just to be rich. So I had that same goal when I, I got into trading. I was actually planning, I did an MBA and I was planning to go to Australia and I wanted to have a couple of years being a bum. And I wanted to chase girls and sit on the beach and grow my beard long. And I just wanted to, I, I'm a hard worker and I knew I was going to start my career. I didn't know what I was going to do. I'm going to start my career and I know I'm going to work hard. So before I yeah. even start, I just want to enjoy life a bit. And then I got this opportunity at this trading company. And I saw, I remember going for the interview in London and I saw these young kids who are 25, 26. And I was like, they're not smarter than me. And they're making so much money. Just back then, there was just free money everywhere in options trading. And so for me, I was like, okay, I, I have the same goal. I want to win the money game. But my goal always, I always, before I started my career, I wanted to, before I went to Australia, actually, I was going to go to Thailand. I wanted to have some professional Thai boxing fights. And um, so I've been doing some Thai boxing training with fighters, but I never actually competed in college. And so I kept that dream alive the whole way through my 20s. And I did something, you know, not exactly the same, but something similar in America. But the whole, the whole reason for me to chase money is I want to win the money game because it's going to give me the freedom to do whatever the hell I want. Yeah. What, what was your goal when you said that? I want to be rich. It was. It was that it was the I want to make enough money to where I can totally retire and I don't have to do anything. And the folly with that goal, and that's kind of, have you guys ever heard of the whole fire movement, right? The, I think it's financially independent, retire early. Yes. Is they're kind of making some sort of conservative nest egg and then they're putting it in dividends or, you know, some, some sort of yielding asset. And then they just live off that. And that was my mentality. I just need to make enough money to, to reach that magical number so that I can go do nothing. And, and there's so many problems with that. Like, first and foremost is, is men need purpose. Right. You, I don't know, you know, and, and so like, isn't a way better vision for your life to say, I want to find something that I love doing with people that I love working with and making good money, but not sacrificing, you know, my, my time or my family's time. Like that to me is the best life you could live. And, and additionally, the, the fire movement, if you will, or the, I just, let me get a number. The problem with that too is, you, that's just such a scarcity mindset, right? Because if you're just living off these dividends, you're constantly looking at your bank account going, ah, I just blew a tire out. Like that's going to be $2,000 for the set. That's really going to set me back. And it's like, what an awful way. <laughs> yeah, we're truly. So um, yeah, my, my vision of it now is I just want to find uh, a, a job that I, I really love doing. I want to surround myself with people that work is... Um, you know, I've created a, a, a cult, uh, cultivated a, a great culture. I'm, I'm changing people's lives and bettering people's lives through, through the work that I'm doing. And I get the flexibility to, to have those moments with the family. And so like, you know, as an example, this morning, we woke up, our family's really big on just big American breakfast every morning. We do the whole thing and woke up this morning, didn't have any eggs. So. 8.30 rolls around. We took the whole family to just a coffee shop down the street. And we just had a slow morning. We all had breakfast together. And that's something I never could have done in a W-2, right? You juxtapose that with the W-2. Well, we don't have any eggs. Sorry, hon. I, I got to get to the office anyway. I'm just not having breakfast this morning. And that to me is like, you cannot quantify that, but it makes all the difference in the world to me to have the autonomy to say, to not have to ask somebody else, hey, can I just go have a slow breakfast with my family and enjoy the morning? 
uh, to be able to make that decision on my own. And so to me, like that's more valuable than any salary or anything that, that, that a job could offer me. I always um, say that, David, when people like people would say, yeah, I've got, I've had friends that say, I've got this, this two different opportunities, you know, and one pays this much and the other one pays that much. Yeah. I'm like, well, that's, that's only one of the metrics. What about the, the flexibility in your schedule? What about the autonomy? You know, are you going to have a, a, an authoritative boss who's, who's talking down to you on one and the other one, you're going to run your own team and do your own thing. There's so many other things to think about. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that, that, uh, that the fire movement and the scarcity mindset, I th I'm so, I'm so glad you, you realized that and you verbalized it because I'm very passionate on talking about what, what is a good approach, a healthy um, way to look at money. So for me, money is a tool. If you're poor and miserable and yeah. you get a lot of money, you're going to be rich and miserable. If you use money to buy back your time and, and try to outsource the things you don't like to do and focus on what you want to do, then it's going to make you happy. But I think that what you said is so important as well. We, we need purpose and humans are happiest not when we objectively arrive somewhere it's when we're improving and i want to do hard things every day like i get in the cold plunge every morning every single morning i don't want to do it and i do it because Ooh. it makes me feel better i also try to do a workout every day most days my back's sore and i'm 45 and i don't really feel like it and i'd rather be lazy but i force myself to do it and i feel better and it's the same with work i want to be doing something that challenges me until the last you know the last days of my life and that the biggest mistake I think people make, the two mistakes they make is one, money is the root of all evil and chasing it is bad. Then you're going to be right. closed off to all the beautiful opportunities that life has to offer if you use money for experiences and, and to, to live, a, live a, a life on your own terms. But then the other side is, it sounds like this guy, I think your old boss, if you miss your kids growing up because you like the prestige and the titles and whatever you're doing. I think you'll get to a certain age and you'll regret the fact that you'll never get those years back. I don't know. Some, I'm sure there's some people that won't, but that's the way I look at it. So you have to go between those two positions. And I think it's, it's a constant, it's like surfing a wave. You're never going to get there. You always have to recalibrate and, um, you know, see where you're at. But I know that, um, John, John sadly can't participate in this part of the conversation, but I know being a, being a dad has made me appreciate so much. Like if I, if I have to, if I have to work late and I can't come home before it gets dark, then I think, oh man, I can't take him and my two dogs, my son and my two dogs to the park. That's our little nightly routine. You know, these, these different yeah. things, like it makes me appreciate the value of my time. And the fact that when you see a kid developmentally changing in a couple of weeks, you realize I'll never get those weeks back. And, um, all my friends with all the kids tell me, Lawrence, enjoy now because I wish I could go back and I wish I could be more present. And I think that's really beautiful. So it sounds like you and I are very aligned on just the way we see time and, and freedom. And there's monetary wealth, but there's also wealth of time, wealth of schedule, health, wealth of health. You know, there's all these different metrics. And I think we have to look at a holistic picture of all of them. Yeah, I, I, um, I love what you said about kids are such a formative change in people's lives. And there's so many reasons why, but challenges and things that are hard create growth. And there are many things harder than having kids i mean it is a huge challenge and it's one of those things in your life that forces you uh, to be less selfish um, and to view life as bigger than yourself to think in terms of decades instead of days and weeks and so for me i think that's that's something admittedly like i still struggle like i'm inherently a pretty selfish person i i, I especially when i juxtapose my just general behaviors with my wife you know, she does everything for our kids. Uh, she's always thinking about the family. It's, it's always in the forefront of her mind. And I think there is a component, like it sounds like you and Lawrence, you and I are aligned on kind of the more traditional roles, such that, hey, I, I recognize or I believe anyway that, that my primary responsibility is as a, as a provider. And her primary responsibility is, is, head, is the head of the household. And I try, I don't always do perfect, but I try to submit to her in a lot of the family decisions because I know that she's doing way more research than I am. She's putting way more thought into it. And ultimately she's making the best decisions that, that she can for our family. And so where I give her a lot of, you know, leeway, graves, and autonomy in that respect, she does the same for me, but just in my realm as well. So that's, that's a system that really works for us. But man, you talk about the most important decision in your life. It's not, it's not a career. It's not five hustle. It's the woman you marry. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great piece of advice. I, I was going to um, pull everything 
together and then circle back and uh and kind of ask you i know we're, we're running out of time but yeah what's one piece of advice that you would give to people out there who are listening that are um living and working in an environment they're not super happy with what would you tell yeah. them to try to motivate them to go out and, and perhaps do something or try something different even if it's already ingrained in their mind that that's not possible the primary question you've got to answer yourself is within the context of the job that that you're currently at are there opportunities within that company where you can contribute more where you could be happier where you could grow more personally answer that question first and if the answer to all that is no then you probably do need to look for other opportunities but but also you know my answer was i wanted to control my time i want personal autonomy that's not everybody's answer and so maybe for people oh, they just want a job that they can kind of and i i did I, when i was a, a manager at, at my oil and gas company i had an employee and i pushed her and i pushed her and she finally sat me down and she said hey I've got grandkids. I've got a family. My job is a very small subset of my life. I just want a job that I can clock in at eight, stay in my lane and do my work, clock out at five and go spend time with my family. And even though it was incredibly countercurrent to the way in which I behave and, and see things, I was like, well, she spent the time and she is figured it out what that is for herself and is super honest. And I was like, got it. We're going to put you in this role. And we ended up just changing her to a completely different department. And we were following up with her uh, six months later. She was processing invoices. So she would get to work every single day. She would process invoices for eight hours and she'd go home. And the next day, it was going to be the same thing. And the next month, it was going to be the next thing. And the next year, it was going to be the same thing. But she said, I've never been happier. So <laughs> my advice for people would be to define really what, what's important to you. Because the answer is not money. Uh, that's the completely wrong answer. So figure out what it is. And if you think it's the right answer, maybe just say, well, what's my number two? Figure out what that is. And then later you'll realize it's not money. But define what that is and figure out if, if, if what you're if what you're doing is, if, if you can get there. Or like what I realized was a W-2 is completely incompatible with what I'm really chasing, even though it was such a great w2 job i mean it was checking all the boxes you know high income i love the people i was working with i was surrounded by smart people we were working on meaningful projects there was upward advancements from a w2 perspective it was just a dream but when i defined that for me i just realized that it's just not in, it's just incongruent with what i'm chasing david you're, you're such a great guy you really are a kindred spirit and it's been such a pleasure so listening to you talk reminds me of um, Neville Ravikant, who's one of my favorite intellectual heroes, and he said, a fit body, a calm mind, and a loving family cannot be bought. They have to be earned. And that's what you're doing, brother. So it's uh, really, yeah. really inspiring. And uh, yeah, it's um, you, you're really ticking all the boxes. And I always say, I come from a jiu-jitsu background, and I always say, the goal is not to get your jiu-jitsu black belt, although that's cool, but you want to be a black belt in life. And in order to be a black belt in life, you have to tick all the boxes. And, and you're, you're a great example of that. 